Hello, everyone. My name is Rich Mariah on behalf of the RNA Club, and I'm here to introduce the next speaker. But first, I want to remind everyone that there'll be a reception after this, and there's a poster session outside. There's also overflow space upstairs. <clears throat> the Wednesday afternoon lecture series, or WALLS, is the highest profile lecture program at the NIH, usually hosted by one of the scientific interest groups. Today's WALLS by Professor Jennifer Doudna is hosted by the NIH RNA Club and to the benefit of everyone here, coincides with this symposium. The WALLS include special lectures named in honor of outstanding members of the NIH community. Today's lecture honors Dr. Margaret Pittman NIH's first female laboratory chief who made significant contributions to microbiology and vaccine development during her long career at the NIAID. <clears throat> Jennifer Doudna is the Li Ka Ching Chancellor's Chair in Biomedical and Health Sciences, Professor of Molecular and Cell Biology, and Professor of Chemistry at UC Berkeley, and Investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Dr. Doudna received her bachelor's degree in biochemistry from Panoma College. She did her PhD work with Jack Sozak in biological chemistry at Harvard University and was also a research fellow with him for two years before joining Tom Check's lab in 1991 as a Lucille P. Markey postdoctoral scholar. Dr. Doudna joined the faculty at Yale University in 1994 and was promoted through the ranks to become the Henry Ford II Professor of Molecular Biophysics and Biochemistry in 1999. She joined the faculty at UC Berkeley in 2002. Professor Dowden is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Institute of Medicine, and the National Academy of Inventors, as well as other esteemed groups. She is recipient of many awards, of which I'll mention just a few. The National Science Foundation Waterman Award, the Foundation for the NIH Lurie Prize, the Paul Janssen Award for Biomedical Research, and most recently, the Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences. Jennifer Doudna's lab has made several seminal contributions to the fields of translation and its regulation, as well as other RNA-related systems. In addition to her current work on the CRISPR-Cas system and her earlier work on ribozymes and RNAi dicer, Dr. Doudna's studies on mRNA translation have provided important insights into the 40S ribosome-associated receptor for activated C kinase, or RAC1, the signal recognition particle, the process of ribosome assembly, and the mechanism of CAP-independent translation. The latter work is highlighted by her studies on the structure of the hepatitis C virus internal ribosome entry site, or IRIS, and on that virus's mechanism of IRIS-mediated translation. She's largely responsible through structural, biochemical, and biological approaches for the rapid understanding and implementation of the CRISPR-Cas genome editing system systems that have fast become widely used in a number of applications, and that's what we'll hear about today. <clears throat> the title of her talk is CRISPR-Cas Genome Surveillance, From Basic Biology to Transformative Technology. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Doudna to the NIH. Well, thank you very much, Rich, for that very warm introduction. It's a great honor for me to be here to honor the uh, work of Margaret Pittman, for sure. And it's also been wonderful to uh, hear some of the talks today. And I'll be here all day tomorrow as well. Looking forward to seeing posters later. Uh, clearly, the RNA world is, is very much uh, alive and well. So um, you know, we've had a longstanding interest in RNA's function in biology. And the story that I want to tell you today is really about uh, work that we started uh, very much as a side project in the laboratory um, and, and really came about due to our interest in RNA interference and the way that, that small RNAs are used in eukaryotic cells and mammalian cells to control uh, gene expression. And, um, and it was really the work that we had done on those systems, including working on the enzyme dicer, uh, 
that led to a phone call that I got in 2005 from a colleague at Berkeley, uh, Jill Banfield, who is in the College of Natural Resources, and we had probably only met once before, but she called me up and said, you know, we're, we're sequencing bacterial genomes, and we're coming across a very unusual sequence signature in, in our data, and I wonder if there's some RNA involvement in a pathway in bacteria that might be something that's sort of parallel to RNA interference, and I wonder if you would like to um, have, have a look at our data. So we got together, and what Jill showed me was that a lot of the bacteria that they were acquiring sequences for had a very um, conspicuous uh, one or more loci in the genome that consisted of a repetitive sequence, typically about 40 base pairs in length, that had a palindromic character, so it had the ability to fold back to form potentially a little hairpin type uh, structure. And in between these repeated sequences were unique sequences of, of about the same length. And these three publications in 2005 had all noted that in many cases you could match the sequences found in these intervening or spacer uh, sequences to those uh, DNA sequences that occur in bacteriophage or in plasmids. And this group proposed that this might be a, some kind of a system that bacteria and archaeal organisms have for defending the genome by acquiring small sequences from their invaders and then perhaps using these uh, sequence uh, signatures in the form of RNA molecules together with uh, CRISPR-associated or Cas uh, genes, proteins that were encoded adjacent to these repetitive loci to form some kind of a bacterial immune system. And at the time, it was a, a hypothesis. There was no experimental data for this, but it, 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 the idea was sort of intriguing to me. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if bacteria had figured out a way to use small RNAs in pathways that are in some ways similar, but in, in, the, in the details very different from how things work in RNA, RNA interference in eukaryotic cells? So we started working on this, and, and a few other labs around the world at the time were, were also intrigued. And over the next several years, what emerged was that um, bacteria that have these, these CRISPR loci, in fact, uh, do have the ability to acquire immunity to phages or to plasmids. And the way this is thought to work is that these uh, systems enable bugs to detect foreign DNA that gets into the cell, and it does seem to be DNA rather than RNA that's detected. And they can acquire small sequences from these foreign elements into the CRISPR locus. And they do this in such a way that each new fragment that's integrated is flanked by a copy of the repeat on either side. And that's actually very important because the next step in the pathway is for this locus to be transcribed into a precursor RNA molecule that is subsequently processed into smaller CRISPR RNAs that each contain a sequence derived from a uh, virus or a plasmid, and these RNAs are then incorporated uh, into complexes that include proteins encoded in these adjacent Cas genes to form interference complexes, very reminiscent functionally of uh, the risk complex in RNAi, and these operate by using the genetic information in the form of this RNA molecule to base pair with DNA and lead to these molecules of degradation through the activities of the Cas proteins. And so we, we began investigating this, and, and a, a, a wonderful a former postdoc came to the lab at around this, uh, when I, right around the time I had had this first conversation with Jill, and uh, Blake Wiedenheft, who came to the lab and, and was really intrigued uh, with this, uh, the idea of working on these systems. And so he actually began purifying these, uh, some of these proteins encoded by the Cas genes and started investigating how they interact with RNA and what their functions are biochemically. And so we initially focused on this sort of central part of the pathway, namely how are these RNAs produced in cells and then how are they assembled into functional interference complexes that lead to DNA uh, degradation. And it was through the sort of a, a, a series of experiments that we did on that system that led to um, my uh, attendance at a, a American Society of Microbiology meeting in 2011, where I met Emmanuel Charpentier, who's pictured right here. And Emmanuel's lab at the time had uh, been studying the CRISPR system in a human pathogen called Streptococcus pyogenes. And in that organism, there was only a single Cas gene that had been shown genetically to be critical for function of the CRISPR system. 
And so uh, Emmanuel asked if we would like to team up with her lab to figure out the function of this gene, which was called Cas9. And so I, I came back to my lab in Berkeley, and uh, Martin Jinek, who was a postdoc at the time, uh, teamed up with Christoph Chylinski, a student in Emmanuel's lab. And these two guys really worked together to start doing biochemical and, and, uh, and, um, and cell-based experiments to figure out the function of Cas9. Um, and assisted eventually by Inez Fanfara, a postdoc with Emmanuel, as well as uh, Mickey Hauer, who is an undergraduate uh, student in the lab, in our lab. And so these guys worked together to test the activity of Cas9. So Martin was able to purify the enzyme, uh, and uh, he sent material to, to Christoph, and these guys started having regular Skype conversations, and um, they figured out together that Cas9 is a really interesting protein that has the ability to cleave double-stranded DNA at sites that are, are dictated by the sequence of a short RNA molecule that's bound by the protein. And so what I'm showing you here is a, a cartoon picture of Cas9 in blue. It contains two active sites, so it has two uh, catalytic centers that each cleave one strand of the double helical DNA. And they do this at a site that is part of this base paired segment of DNA that interacts with a 20 nucleotide stretch of sequence found in the CRISPR RNA molecule, which is this strand of RNA right here. And there were two very important things about, that they figured out about the way this actually works. One was that uh, the sites that are cleaved in the DNA have to be adjacent to a short motif called the PAM, which for this particular Cas9 enzyme is a GG dinucleotide motif, or two GC base pairs next to each other, so that's the PAM. And the other thing that was critical for activity was that um, this, this protein turned out to require not just one, but actually two uh, RNAs, so it's a dual RNA-guided endonuclease that uses a second RNA molecule called the tracer, which is here in red, that Emmanuel's lab had found previously to be critical for processing of CRISPR RNAs, and it turns out this RNA remains base paired to the, uh, to the CRISPR RNA, and it forms a structure that is essential to recruit the Cas9 protein. And so it's really through the, acti the, uh, the, the binding of the, this uh, dual RNA complex that Cas9 is activated to become a, um, a programmable enzyme that will cleave DNA at sites that are programmed by this uh, sequence right here. And so, uh, so, you know, up until this point, for us, the project had really been a curiosity-driven uh, project, and you know, it, we were just wondering how this worked and, and fascinated at the discovery of this, this sort of incredible uh, programmable protein. And there was a, a great day when Martin was in my office and he was showing me his biochemical data, and what he had been doing was trimming away at sequences found naturally in the tracer RNA, which is this RNA strand here on the bottom, and the CRISPR RNA, which is this sequence right here, and this is the double-stranded DNA target. And what Martin found was that only the sequences of RNA in this blue box were essential for Cas9 to function. And that gave us the idea that we might be able to create a simplified system, simpler than what nature does, in which we could actually covalently link together the CRISPR RNA and the tracer RNA to create a chimeric or single guide RNA that would provide both the targeting information and the Cas9 protein binding information in the same molecule. And so we, we had sort of a sketch like this up on my whiteboard, and we thought maybe it would be as simple as just putting in a, um, a linker between the ends of the, these RNAs to create this kind of a single guide. So Martin, I think, almost literally ran to the lab and, and, and designed uh, some RNAs to test this idea. And he did a very, very simple uh, biochemical experiment. And the idea was to take a purified plasmid uh, DNA molecule that we had in the lab, and he designed five different uh, versions of the single guide RNA that were programmed to recognize these sequences shown by the red bars. And we just chose sites in the plasmid that were adjacent in each case to a GG dinucleotide in the DNA. And, um, and then we did an experiment where we programmed Cas9 with one of these uh, single guide RNAs in each reaction together with uh, a second enzyme, uh, Sal1, which is a restriction enzyme that cuts about 60 base pairs upstream of this region in the plasmid. And when we uh, analyzed the products of those reactions on an agarose gel system, we got uh, this result down here, in which, uh, where we saw that in each case, the little fragment of DNA that was released from the plasmid by doubly digesting it uh, 
these, each of these fragments corresponded in length to the size we expected based on the uh, site where Cas9 was programmed to recognize. And this was really the moment, you know, when we realized we had a, uh, a fully programmable protein that by using this engineered system, we had a system that was a, a two-component uh, system with a, a single protein and a single RNA that would direct uh, this activity. And so uh, we, when we published this work, we actually proposed that this could be a, an interesting uh, system for RNA programmable genome editing. And, um, and this was actually the first time that, that you know, the, sort of the CRISPR uh, field, which at the time was, you know, still very, very small, was sort of um, uh, becoming to the attention of, of people outside of our, our little community. And, and the reason that we had this idea about using the system for genome engineering was really because in parallel with the work that we and others had been doing in this field was a lot of research over this, the past really several decades uh, to understand how it might be possible to engineer the DNA in living organisms and cells. And um, what had emerged, um, and this sort of took me back to when I was a graduate student in Jack Shostak's lab, and he, he and Der Terry Orr Weaver had published the double strand break repair model for DNA. Uh, and and uh, so what had been appreciated by many groups was that uh, DNA in cells, when it receives a double-stranded break, has pathways for repairing this break that include either non-homologous end joining, in which case the double-stranded break is repaired with a, often with the introduction of a small um, insertion or deletion at the site of the repair, or if there's a donor DNA molecule or template DNA present in the cell that has homology to these uh, broken ends of the DNA, this can serve as a uh, molecule that, that is incorporated into the DNA by homologous recombination for homology-directed repair. And so the challenge was, how do you introduce double-stranded breaks where you want them, where you'd like uh, changes to occur in the genome? And as many of you know, a lot of uh, really beautiful work had been done using proteins to do this. And so starting with zinc finger nucleases and then subsequently talons, and uh, homing endonucleases, these were all protein-based systems where uh, these uh, proteins could be programmed by uh, design and, and engineering to recognize a particular sequence of DNA. And by coupling them to uh, endonuclease cleavage domains, they could be turned into uh, programmable endonucleases for DNA. Um, and they can work extremely well. Um, the challenge is that a new protein or a pair of proteins has to be generated for each site in a genome where one might like to introduce a change. And we thought uh, that with this Cas9 system, we had a single uh, protein that could be the same in every experiment, and its targeting specificity could be changed by simply re-engineering this short DNA mole uh, RNA molecule that it binds to, to, re to recognize a different sequence of DNA. So we set to work to test this, and, um, and what happened next was truly beyond uh, what, I, what I could have expected. Uh, within six months, there were three papers from the lab of George Church, the lab of Feng Zhang, and, and from us, showing that you could actually use Cas9 to uh, make changes, targeted changes, in the genomes of mammalian cells. And within uh, just not long after that, there were a whole series of papers that began to appear from many groups around the world showing that you could actually use this system to carry out genome editing in various kinds of uh, cells and, and organisms. And um, in addition to making covalent changes to the genome, it also turned out to be possible to use this system as a, a platform for interaction with DNA uh, it, at, a, at a very specific place where you might like to either observe activities or uh, affect changes that are not covalent in the genome. And so, for example, it's been possible to make uh, versions of catalytically inactive uh, Cas9 that can be used to control transcription, either uh, as an activator or a repressor, and it's also been possible uh, to use this system for live cell imaging of specific genomic loci using fluorescently tagged uh, versions of Cas9. So, uh, so you know, this, this has been a really a fun time for our lab to be involved in this and helping us to get involved in fields of science that we really have never engaged in in the past. And, and so what I want to do uh, today is really I want to share with you two things. I want to show you some of the work that we're, we have ongoing in the lab to understand uh, how Cas9 actually works and how we can use mechanistic information to help us, uh, help us to, uh, even to develop this further as a technology. 
And then I want to, um, in the, in the, in the uh, latter part of the talk, I just want to share with you some new biology about CRISPR systems that we're learning that I think is um, very, just I think is an interesting uh, aspect of the way these systems work, and, and, but also has potential to lead to new technologies. So uh, these are the sort of two of the questions that we've been really keen to address in the lab. We really want to understand how it is that Cas9 is able to find uh, target sites. And if you think about this, certainly in, in, uh, in, in uh, the, the human genome, for example, there's a vast uh, excess of DNA over the, the target sequence that you might be uh, trying to go after or, or programming Cas9 to recognize. So how does it find uh, sites accurately and what does it do when it gets there? And, um, and then I'm going to also tell you a little bit about how we can use mechanistic information about, about Cas9's activity to change the kinds of substrates that it interacts with by, uh, by tricking it um, to, to uh, interact with substrates that it normally doesn't bind to in nature, namely uh, RNA molecules. So I'm, I'm going to um, first tell you, just sort of summarize some of the work that we've done to address this question. And one of the, key, one of the first things that we did was to team up with the lab of Eric Green at Columbia and two gr terrific graduate students, one in my lab, Sam Sternberg, and the other, Cy Redding, in, in Eric's lab, uh, got together to do some experiments using single molecule uh, curtains of DNA that Eric's lab had developed. And the way these work is that, so Eric's lab had showed that you could actually take these uh, DNA molecules, which are shown here as these green uh, strands. So these are 48 KB individual uh, phage lambda uh, DNA molecules. So they're basically the normal substrate that Cas9 would interact with. And uh, they've been attached to a slide on one end. And um, we can visualize them by an intercalating uh, dye this, uh, that stains them green. And when we turn on the buffer flow, we have the molecules extended. So buffer is flowing from top to bottom across the slide. And when we turn off the buffer flow, um, these molecules snap back up to the origin. And so we can toggle back and forth and then look at where these uh, molecules of Cas9 uh, line up on the, on the DNA. And these are, uh, these are Cas9 proteins that have been labeled uh, with a quantum dot, and then they're visualized by turf microscopy. And so what you can see in this example is that a lot of these uh, proteins actually line up on the DNA at a particular place, and that turns out to correspond to the site in the lambda genome that they are uh, programmed to recognize with the guide RNA they contain. And, um, and so Sam and Sai were able to show that they could program Cas9 with different guides and get plots that look like this, which told us that in this kind of single molecule experiment, we could get the kind of programmed behavior of Cas9 that we, we hoped we would see. And then we started using this sort of assay to figure out uh, some of the properties of Cas9, how it interacts with both bona fide target sequences and what happens when it interacts with DNA that is not uh, a target sequence or not a match to the guide RNA. And, and one of the things that we found was that um, when, uh, when Cas9 interacts at sites that are not cognate, don't have a, an exact uh, base pair match to the guide RNA, uh, we found that um, the interaction with the lambda DNA didn't not, did not look random, but instead it actually looked like uh, there was a, uh, a, a, an overabundance of interaction sites on this end of the lambda genome compared to this end over here. And when we looked at the sequence of the genome, it turns out that this end is much more GC rich than, uh, than this end. And that gave us the idea that perhaps what we were actually observing was uh, interactions of this protein RNA complex with the PAM sequence in, in DNA, namely these uh, sites where there were GG um, dinucleotides or G two GC base pairs in a row. And when we plotted this, the, the correlation of that uh, over here, you can see that it's not a great correlation, but it's actually not, uh, not random either. So it looked like there might be something to this. And so we thought that maybe what we, were, what we had been calling nonspecific binding might actually be specific for PAM sites. And so Sam Sternberg, uh, who had been doing a lot of this work in New York City with, with uh, Cy in Eric's lab, came back to Berkeley. And he designed, a, again, a very simple biochemical experiment to test this idea. And the idea was to simply use a bulk cleavage assay in which we took radio-labeled DNA molecules that include a target sequence adjacent to a PAM site, um, program Cas9 to recognize this, which, in which case we would get, we expected to get very efficient and rapid cutting of the DNA. And then uh, we added different kinds of unlabeled DNA competitor molecules to the reaction, thinking that if these could bind efficiently to Cas9, they would effectively compete 
for uh, Cas9's ability to interact with this radio-labeled substrate and cut it. And so when we do a control experiment, um, this just shows you experiments where we take radio-labeled uh, DNA, so this uh, target sequence right here, and uh, we can do a very short five-minute time course, and we get cleavage of this molecule by the Cas9 RNA complex. And the more uh, competitor we add, and in this case, we're just using the exact same sequence as this substrate, except in a non-radio-labeled form. The more of that we add, of course, the more competition we get. And you can see very little cleavage here when we have a lot of the competitor around. And so this was the basis of, of this assay. And so then we started testing different kinds of competitors. Um, to see whether this idea about PAM interaction with Cas9 was right. And so the competitors that uh, Sam tested first included this set right here, where we had a series of DNA molecules that had no uh, sequence complementarity to the target site um, in, the, in the substrate molecule, but they had different numbers of PAMs, ranging from none to a lot. And when we tested those as competitors in this, in this kind of a cleavage reaction, what we found was that these, the ability of these molecules to compete for Cas9 binding correlated exactly with the number of PAMs in the DNA. So this molecule here that has lots of PAMs in the sequence is a great competitor, whereas this one here that has no PAMs is a very poor competitor in the reaction. And I think the most informative uh, competitor was actually this one here, a DNA molecule that has an exact match uh, in terms of the target sequence compared to the the substrate molecule up here, but had a single base pair change in the PAM. And what we found was that this DNA molecule is as poor a competitor as this one here that has no PAMs and no target site, right? So it's, it's right here. So that really suggests that, that Cas9 really interacts with DNA by first interacting with the PAM, and only then does it actually interrogate the adjacent sequence for a base pair match to the guide RNA. And so just summarizing some of the, the conclusions that we drew from this set of experiments and this collaboration with Eric's lab um, was, first of all, that we found that, uh, that, there, that there was very high affinity binding to product DNA. And what Sam was able to show, um, again, in bulk biochemical experiments, was that that meant there was no substrate turnover. So this is a protein that binds the DNA, cuts it, and then remains very tightly associated with those cleaved ends of the DNA unless something external uh, knocks it off. Secondly, uh, as I showed you, we think that binding occurs first at these PAM motifs. And we also uh, found, and I'll show you some, some data for this in a few moments, that, uh, that PAM binding does more than just recruit Cas9. It actually also triggers uh, the catalytic activity of Cas9. And we think this is ultimately going to have to do with a structural uh, rearrangement that occurs in the protein. So, uh, so we've been working away on, on getting some structural insights uh, into, into this uh, enzyme. And one of the first clues that we had to, to how this, this might work as a kind of a dynamic machine actually came from some low-resolution EM work that we did with, in collaboration with uh, Eva Nogales, my colleague at Berkeley. And again, two uh, students that teamed up, Sam Sternberg and David Taylor, who got together and started using negative stain electron microscopy to look at different forms of Cas9, um, starting with the protein alone, and then looking at the protein bound to a guide RNA, and finally, uh, that protein RNA complex bound to a DNA substrate. And this is really summarizing a large amount of work that they did. They had, uh, were able to put labels on different parts of the protein, and they put biotins on the ends of the RNA and DNA molecules, and all of those uh, experimental data put together led to this model in which what we found was that Cas9 starts off in a sort of a closed conformation. We could see two um, clear kind of structural lobes of the protein. In blue, the part of the protein that contained the catalytic centers, and in gray, the part that was mostly responsible for binding to the RNA. And we saw that when we added the guide RNA, there was a big rearrangement in the structure that opened up a channel down the center between these two lobes. And when the DNA was bound, that was exactly where this, uh, we thought this RNA-DNA hybrid was forming, it was in this channel between the two lobes. And so what's been really fun is to, over the last year or so, as crystal structures have become available from, from our lab, from the lab of, of uh, Osamu Nureki, and from, uh, Alex, from uh, Martin Jinnick's lab, we've been able to take this model and, um, and compare it to what we can now see at high resolution in different conformational states of the protein. And I want to show you a little movie that morphs between 
Uh, the structure of Cas9 in the unliganded state, which is this uh, state right here, moving into a structure that includes the guide RNA and uh, a DNA substrate. And I think you'll see something really, really, you'll see something really remarkable here, which is basically that this protein undergoes a huge rearrangement in structure that we think might help explain the energetics of, of DNA duplex opening that this, this protein has to be able to, uh, to catalyze. So, uh, so we start off looking at this in the unliganded state, and the, the catalytic domains are here in uh, blue and gold, cal colors, and, um, and then here's the gray uh, part of the protein, which is uh, responsible for RNA binding. And, um, and I'm going to show you first th this uh, conformational change going from the APO state, the unliganded form, to what it looks like when it's bound to RNA and DNA there. So we go back and forth, and you can see it's a hinging motion right around this long uh, purple helix, that allows this, uh, this rearrangement. And I'm gonna show it to you again in a different view, and we've cut away initially uh, um, one of the domains, but I'll, you'll see that fading in, because there's a large domain here that actually moves very dramatically from one end of this uh, protein structure to the other, and it actually ends up at the end of the RNA-DNA hybrid, which is right here in the center of this protein. And, um, and so this is a really uh, remarkable rearrangement, and we, we, didn't, we sort of didn't believe it at first. And we now have a lot of data, we've been able to, and this is again work of, uh, mostly of Sam, Sam Sternberg in the lab, who's been able to put uh, various FRET labels on different parts of this protein such that we can actually monitor these conformational changes. And we really have very nice evidence that this is exactly what's happening, is that this protein is really rearranging as it binds to DNA. And so our current thinking about how it interacts, how Cas9 really interacts with, uh, with uh, genomic DNA is that um, this is a complex that we think has very fast kinetics on and off the DNA. We saw no evidence in any of our single molecule or other experiments that this is a processive protein. It looks like it's very rapidly interacting with DNA. And we think that uh, when it encounters a PAM, that that actually slows down the off rate sufficiently that there can be uh, time for initial interrogation of the adjacent DNA sequence. And um, if there is the uh, potential for base pairing between the guide RNA and this end of the DNA duplex, that begins to unwind the DNA. And, um, and if this proceeds through the length of the target sequence, then that results in a productive complex that then uh, positions the catalytic sites to actually generate a double-stranded break uh, in the DNA. Um, and so with that kind of mechanistic understanding, we wanted to ask, you know, can we take that information and, and, uh, and, and, and basically get Cas9 to interact with substrates it normally doesn't uh, bind to or cleave, namely uh, RNA molecules. So we have no evidence that in nature Cas9 is interacting uh, with RNA, but um, we started wondering if this might be possible to do under uh, certain circumstances. And this idea really came about, again, from some experiments that that Sam Sternberg and a rotation student, Ben Oakes, uh, did together, in which uh, they were testing different kinds of DNA substrates. And Sam had made this uh, sort of interesting observation that if he, um, if he compared, um, hmm, interesting, sorry about that. So if he compared a double-stranded DNA substrate to a single strand of DNA that's exactly the same as this one, so it can base pair with the guide RNA, we found that this single strand of DNA was a very poor substrate for Cas9 compared to the double-stranded DNA. And so we started asking, what do we need to add back to this DNA strand to get it to be cleaved effectively by Cas9? And what Sam found was that as soon as he added back a short uh, DNA molecule that included the, the PAM nucleotides, then this uh, DNA became a good substrate, again, for cleavage by Cas9. And we found that all of these different substrates were bound very similarly by Cas9, shown by these, these blue bars, but only the molecules that included the GG nucleotides of the PAM on the ends were effectively cut uh, by the enzyme. And, um, and so that uh, made us think that there might be a binding pocket, and this was all being done before structures of the protein were available, so we were thinking that there must be a binding pocket in the protein that somehow binds these PAM nucleotides. And so maybe we could actually occupy that binding site with a, an exogenous molecule and trigger the activity of Cas9 without having the PAM uh, uh, located actually in the substrate molecule itself. And so the idea was to take single-stranded nucleic acid, here I'm showing you for DNA, but we thought we might also be able to do this for RNA, 
and use a PAM-containing oligo. We started calling these PAMers in the lab. And, um, and basically uh, program Cas9 by adding the PAMmer to provide the PAM interaction and then use the targeting information in the guide uh, RNA sequence to interact with this single-stranded substrate to affect a complex that would be able to lead to productive cleavage of this single-stranded molecule. And so, um, so this uh, project then was kind of a, a terrific team of, of people in the lab uh, that got together to do this. Sam and Ben, as I mentioned, as well as Alex Seletsky, another uh, graduate student, and Mitch O'Connell, a postdoc. And so the four of, the, uh, four of them uh, teamed up to do these experiments. And what they found was that they could actually uh, get very nice uh, cutting of single-stranded RNA in the presence of PAMMERS, and that's shown right here. So this is a control on the left-hand side. This is a denaturing gel uh, system showing cleavage of a radio-labeled double-stranded DNA. So I've showed you this before with Cas9. If we try to cleave a single-stranded RNA substrate, it's a very poor uh, substrate, not surprisingly. But if we add in these PAMMER oligos, we found that we could get pretty decent cutting of these uh, single-stranded RNAs. And interestingly, no cutting of a double-stranded RNA substrate. So the PAM nucleotides, at least in our hands, have to be uh, uh, DNA at this point. And uh, we also found that this activity was programmable, so we could program Cas9 with different guide RNAs that would interact with different uh, single-stranded RNA sequences, and then only the RNA matching the sequence of the guide RNA would be uh, cleaved in these reactions, and we could quantify that over here. And, uh, and so we started thinking about how, how we might want to actually use this. And, and we thought that actually the most interesting application initially, at least from our perspective, was actually not for cleaving RNA, because there's lots of other ways to, to do that uh, in cells, but, but to actually bind endogenous transcripts, which is a, a tricky thing to do. And we thought, wouldn't it be great if you could bind endogenous transcripts without having to engineer anything into them and isolate them with their associated factors, proteins, nucleic acids, or, or whatever. And um, so the idea was to, uh, and this was the scheme that Mitch O'Connell came up with, was to use uh, PAMers, and we started playing around with different lengths of these to get efficient binding to our target sequences. Um, and then we have our uh, uh, Cas9, and in this case we're using the catalytically inactive form of the enzyme together with the uh, guide RNA. And then we put a biotin tag on the, on the protein so that we can affinity purify these complexes that come out. And then the idea was to, to generate uh, guide RNAs that would recognize endogenous transcript sequences that we could use to isolate these molecules out of cells. And this turned out to actually work rather well. So this is uh, just the results of, of two experiments that were done using either total uh, RNA from HeLa cells or just a HeLa cell lysate. And in the top panel, what you're looking at are, is uh, the result of an experiment in which uh, Mitch had designed guide RNAs to recognize several different exon sequences in the GAPDH uh, transcript, which is a 1.5 kb uh, transcript. And he found in this experiment that in at least two of these uh, cases, with these two different versions of the PAMR, we could actually get very decent recovery of GAPDH uh, transcripts with very little uh, background binding of, a, of other uh, RNAs in the experiment. And then down here on the bottom is the experiment using HeLa lysate, and this is trickier because we, now we have, uh, you know, the contents of, of the cell there and, and all of the, the proteins and, and other things that are associated with these RNAs. And um, in this case, we found that we had to play around with different versions of the PAMR, and so these are different uh, uh, types of, of chemically modified DNAs, mostly 2 prime omethyl containing uh, DNAs to find ones that would support Cas9 binding to the transcript without also supporting RNase H cleavage of a DNA RNA hybrid, which is what you're seeing here, binding by Cas9, but then subsequently cutting by RNase H uh, activity in the lysate. So we found two versions of the PAMR that work for this. And we're currently using this approach in the laboratory to isolate uh, native transcripts and actually look at uh, associated proteins. And we hope this will become a method that will be uh, useful. We're also working with a number of groups to try to get this actually uh, functional in live cells where you could potentially you know, per have things very unperturbed before uh, actually isolating transcripts and looking at their um, associated factors. So um, in the last uh, part of the talk, I just want to turn to some new work that we've been doing on another aspect of the CRISPR system, namely this um, first part of the pathway, which is really essential to get the whole thing going in, in cells in the first place, 
which is the ability of these systems to acquire new sequences and integrate them into the CRISPR locus. And this is clearly something that you know, cells have to be able to do this if they want to have a functional system. And there's lots of beautiful genetic data showing that these CRISPR systems evolve uh, in some cases quite rapidly and the phage that they are attacking evolve as well, right? So there's sort of this constant warfare going on. And so these systems have to be able to acquire new spacers constantly if they're going to remain uh, active. And so um, this, is, this is just showing, uh, sort of uh, illustrating how, how sort of a cartoon vision of how this might occur. It's known that when these new sequences are acquired, they're actually integrated uh, most of the time in uh, the uh, sort of the front end of the CRISPR locus adjacent to what's called the leader sequence, which is a typically a very AT-rich uh, sequence here. And when they go into the locus, they are flanked by a copy of the repeat sequence on either side. And, and we know that that's actually very important for the way the RNAs are subsequently processed. Um, and so uh, several groups had been sort of investigating this. And what had been found was that two genes uh, that encode proteins called Cas1 and Cas2 are actually uh, found in all CRISPR-Cas systems. And these two proteins turn out to be nucleases that you can, uh, you can show in vitro can cleave uh, DNA and in some cases RNA. It was a little bit unclear what their activities might, what their specificities might actually be. Um, but a very nice experiment was done by Udi Kimron's lab um, a, a couple of years ago in which they were able to show that uh, they could overexpress the Cas1 and Cas2 proteins in cells that included a, um, a CRISPR locus, but none of the other Cas genes that would be naturally part of these systems. And then the overexpression of these two proteins was sufficient to integrate new spacers into the CRISPR locus, such that you got expansion of the locus. And so that really suggested that these two proteins were somehow responsible for the integrase activity that was um, uh, endogenous to the system. So, um, so James Nunez, a student um, in my lab, uh, started investigating what the function of these two proteins might actually be. And um, one of the first things that he did was to, uh, he started uh, purifying these, these, uh, these two proteins and he figured out that he showed first uh, biochemically and then subsequently in a, in a structure, uh, crystal structure that he solved, that these proteins actually form a complex uh, in cells and that's actually important for the integrase activity. So this is uh, the, the crystal structure that uh, we published last year of this complex. And what James had found was that when he made uh, mutations that disrupted the, um, this interface between the Cas2 dimer here in the center and this, uh, each of these Cas2, Cas1 uh, dimers on either side, if he disrupted that interface, he actually lost the ability to observe spacer integration into the CRISPR locus. So that clearly you know, suggested that this was some kind of a functional complex. Um, but the question really was, how does it work? And so James um, just, again, did a very uh, simple kind of biochemical experiment in which he took the purified Cas1 and Cas2 proteins and, um, and he generated a, a, a set of what we thought would, be, would look like sort of the substrates for the integration reaction, namely these 33 base pair DNA molecules that, um, that get uh, inserted into the CRISPR locus. And then he incubated these proteins, these uh, DNA substrates, with a plasmid target, uh, 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 plasmid that includes the CRISPR locus uh, cloned into the plasmid. And, um, he was very uh, excited to see that he actually got some, uh, a lot of products from, from this reaction, but only in the presence of both the Cas1 and Cas2 proteins. So this is, you're looking here at an agarose gel where we've just taken uh, this plasmid called pre-CRISPR. Here's the plasmid alone. Um, and if we incubate it with Cas1 or Cas2 only, we see very little happening to the plasmid. But if we have both proteins present, as well as these, uh, these um, uh, DNA substrate molecules called protospacers, we actually saw uh, changes happening to the plasmid that corresponded to relaxed open circle uh, DNA, linearized DNA, a little faint amount of that there, and then something that uh, we call band X. And I'm not going to say too much about band X, but I'd be happy to, we, we know what it is, and I'll, I'll be happy to tell you um, later what, what it is. Um, and, and so one of the, the first things that James did was to titrate in different amounts of this, uh, this substrate or protospacer DNA, and he found that um, he got more of these reaction products as a function of increased concentration of protospacer. So it really looked like it was something happening in the presence of 
of these, uh, these little DNA molecules. And by radio labeling the DNAs, he could um, actually show that two of the products that we observed in those initial uh, agarose gel experiments actually um, become radio labeled when you use uh, radio labeled double stranded DNA substrates, namely these uh, products corresponding to the relaxed open circle form of the plasmid as well as these linear um, uh, products that we thought were linear uh, plasmid right here. Bandex does not become uh, radio labeled, by the way. And, uh, and so he did a number of experiments uh, to show that um, if, he if he tested catalytically inactivated versions of the Cas1 protein, we found that uh, we got no, uh, no, uh, no products, none of these uh, possible uh, integration products right here. If we tested uh, catalytically inactive forms of Cas2, however, we saw no disruption of production of these products. So it looked like the Cas1 catalytic activity is essential, but not the catalytic activity of Cas2, at least for, these, uh, for this particular type of reaction. And we also found that if we disrupted the Cas1 and Cas2 complex by making uh, interface mutants that we had tested previously, uh, that also prevented production of these products. And in data that I'm not showing you directly, we found that the, uh, the target plasmid has to be supercoiled for this to work. So if we pre-nicked or linearized the plasmid, even though the sequence was exactly the same, we got no, uh, in a, none of these sort of uh, products. And so um, at this point, we contacted Alan Engelman at Harvard Medical School, who's worked for a long time on HIV uh, integrase, and, and started uh, working with him and, and, and members of his lab to think about what these products might be and how we could do experiments that would help elucidate their, what, their identity. And so, uh, so the, the hypothesis that we had um, was that this uh, product right here, which corresponded to a nicked open circle form of the plasmid and becomes radio-labeled when we use uh, radio-labeled um, DNA substrate molecules might correspond to molecules that look like this, where they had either uh, been ligated on one end to the, uh, this uh, double-stranded DNA substrate with resulting nicking of the plasmid, or potentially on both ends to lead to a, um, an insertion event that had these open ends on either side. Um, and for the linearized product, we thought that might correspond to two partial uh, ligation events where we had two different DNA molecules ligated onto the plasmid leading to a uh, linearization of the plasmid. Um, and so in looking through the literature for integrases and, 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 and different kinds of uh, transposases and how they work, it looks like, looked like there were really two uh, sort of primary mechanisms for these kinds of enzymes. One, in one case, um, there's a formation of a protein uh, covalent intermediate that typically involves uh, tyrosine residues that become attached to the nucleic acid uh, as an intermediate step in the integration reaction. And, and when we looked in the active site of Cas1, there were several uh, tyrosines that were sort of in proximity that we thought could you know, be involved in that sort of chemistry. But another uh, class of these uh, enzymes, such as HIV integrase and transposases, actually work by catalyzing a direct nucleophilic attack. So what they do is they actually take the uh, molecule to be inserted and they uh, activate the three prime hydroxyl as a nucleophile that attacks a particular phosphodiester bond in the target molecule and leads to a ligation event and then eventually to um, this insertion intermediate and then followed by repair enzymes that could seal up the gaps in the cell. So James uh, was able to mutate the uh, made uh, tyrosine uh, mut mutations of the tyrosine residues in the active site of Cas1. And even though those proteins fold up and they, um, they, they see, they, we can express them and purify them, uh, they, and, and they, they really had no, we saw no effect uh, for the most part on activity. So they all seem to be uh, pretty uh, happy proteins. But in contrast, we found that um, the three prime hydroxyls of these DNA molecules were essential to form uh, these products that we get in these in, these in vitro reactions. So, James found that neither uh, single strand of the DNA could uh, produce these uh, products that we found in vitro. And here's what I showed you before with the double-stranded uh, DNA substrate being used. And if he blocked the three prime hydroxyls on both ends of these DNA molecules with phosphates, we saw no uh, products generated. And if he generated a partially uh, blocked DNA that has a phosphate on one end but not the other, we saw uh, some products but uh, in, in, at reduced levels. So this really suggested that this um, Cas1, Cas2 complex is operating somehow by 
uh, activating these uh, three prime hydroxyls as nucleophiles to catalyze this kind of chemistry where you get a uh, ligation reaction between the substrate DNA protospacer and the target sequence at a, uh, we thought probably at a particular site, although at this point we didn't know where this might be occurring in the plasmid, to lead to a product that would look like this, sort of an intermediate of the integration reaction. So the question was, where is this happening? And so to figure this out, um, we had our opportunity to do deep sequencing, which was fun. Um, so James basically prepared two, uh, two uh, conducted two reactions, one with this target plasmid that included the CRISPR locus, and the other with a control plasmid that had no uh, CRISPR locus uh, in it, cloned into it, and did the same uh, reaction that I showed you before, incubating with Cas1 and Cas2 and these little DNA uh, substrate molecules, and then generated libraries from each of these uh, sets of reaction products and did sequencing to figure out where these potential uh, ligation events might be occurring. And, um, and I'll just, uh, I'm just going to show you um, the results initially of the uh, experiment using the plasmid containing the CRISPR locus. And, um, and this is what we found. So we found that, um, it, so this has a sort of a full-sized uh, CRISPR locus uh, cloned into the plasmid. And we found that at every junction between um, either the leader sequence and the first repeat or these individual spacers in yellow and the repeat sequences, we found uh, uh, integration events more so on this strand for some reason, and many more on the, on the end closest to the leader sequence. Um, but these were exact uh, integrations, so they occur exactly at those boundaries. And um, interestingly, also found uh, that outside of that locus, there was a, were a fair number of events that occurred in the, uh, sort of near the ampicillin promoter in this plasmid, and I'll come back to that in a moment, because I think it tells us something interesting about the way the system actually works. So this is just showing you where these uh, integration, uh, these in, uh, insertion, I should say ligation, uh, really, events were happening at these boundaries. And, um, and if, sort of trying to think about how this might be working, we um, looked at the structure and sequence of these repeats. And as I mentioned before, these are actually partial palindromes. So they have the ability to fold up into hairpins. And these hairpin structures are actually critical at the RNA level because they specify where these RNA molecules that are made as precursors are processed to produce the mature CRISPR RNAs. But it turns out very interestingly that we think the exact same structure at the DNA level is really critical for specifying this, uh, inter this uh, site of initial ligation of these DNA substrates because um, there's a sort of, an, we think, a correspondence between the ability of the DNA to form these cruciforms, which, by the way, would probably be the reason that we need to, to uh, have supercoiled DNA as a substrate, a, a recipient plasmin for these reactions, and uh, the ability of the Cas1 and Cas2 complex potentially to recognize this kind of a, a structure in the DNA and then catalyze the reaction a distance away in the, uh, in the DNA. Um, okay. So what happened in the plasmid that didn't have the CRISPR locus? So I thought we probably wouldn't see any integration events, but we actually did. Uh, they occur at a lower level, um, but um, the, uh, there's, a, again, sort of an interesting abundance of these uh, events that occur at the same site that we saw in the CRISPR plasmid outside of the CRISPR locus, namely near this ampicillin promoter. And when we looked at that sequence in the plasmid, it turns out that just sort of fortuitously, it's a there's sort of this AT-rich sequence in the promoter that's adjacent to a partial palindrome in the DNA that can form this potential cruciform-type structure. And the, uh, these uh, insertion or ligation events are occurring nine nucleotides away. So it's a very, potentially forming a very similar kind of structure to what uh, forms in the context of these CRISPR repeats. Um, and so I just wanted to show you quickly one experiment that was done recently by Tracy Hinder, a chemical biology rotation student in the lab, who has been uh, following up on this by, she, what she did was to generate a, plasma, a target plasmid that had just one uh, CRISPR repeat uh, spacer unit in it with a leader sequence, so we thought there might be only one place where the, these uh, ligation events could occur, and that's exactly right, so she sees very... Um, very sort of specific targeting in this uh, locus of the plasmin when she does the same kind of experiment with uh, deep sequencing to analyze the sites of, of these ligation events. And then she made a mutation in the plasmid that disrupted the uh, base pairing in this uh, possible 
uh, hairpin type structure that might form in the DNA. And in that mutated form of the plasmid, we saw, first of all, many fewer events uh, of, of ligation occurring, but also they occur uh, all over, right? So there's, it really loses the, the specificity for a particular site in that case. So it looks like these are active enzymes that are looking for a site to catalyze this, this reaction if they don't have um, a bona fide uh, sort of uh, target structure and sequence, they find other sites but at very low efficiency. And so this is our current model for the way we think uh, these new spacers are integrated. We think that actually um, that uh, there's an initial nucleophilic attack that's catalyzed by the Cas1 enzyme as part of this Cas1, Cas2 complex at sites that are um, adjacent to these cruciform type structures that can form in the CRISPR repeats. And then once that initial reaction occurs, then a second um, uh, reaction, similar reaction occurring uh, using the other three prime hydroxyl of the DNA can then lead to formation of an intermediate that looks like this. And we just very recently, Addison Wright, a student in the lab, has been able to show that we actually get these, uh, these uh, doubly uh, ligated intermediates in vitro in our reaction. So we're generating these, and we think that once this is formed by Cas1 and Cas2 in the cell, these would then be filled in by repair enzymes and ligated to produce the fully um, functional form of the CRISPR locus with an expanded, um, now an additional uh, spacer present. And so I just want to end by, by um, you know, I think this is sort of fun on, on two levels. One is that we think this actually suggests an interesting way that these CRISPR loci arise in naive organisms. So in organisms that don't have a CRISPR locus, we think that if they uh, happen to acquire the Cas1 and Cas2 complex, say on, by horizontal transfer on a plasmid, these, uh, this uh, complex would have the ability at, at a low efficiency to find uh, sites in the genome that have this sort of structure and start integrating uh, little sequences. And once you get one integration event, we think that would then make it more likely to get a second one, et cetera. And so you could start to imagine how these CRISPR loci actually build up in, uh, in new organisms that don't, or in organisms that don't have a CRISPR locus to begin with. Um, and the other thing we're playing around with right now is to test whether we can actually use this as a way to integrate foreign DNA into uh, a host genome. And in vitro, what we found is that, um, the, that this uh, enzyme complex is able to accept DNAs of many different lengths for integration. So although in vivo, in, in bacteria, there's a very specific size of these spacers that is integrated, we don't know yet what really dictates that. It seems like, at least in this purified system, uh, this enzyme complex is, is very accepting of DNAs that are longer, potentially. So we're really interested in exploring that and the potential of that to integrate DNA into host genomes using that kind of strategy. So I just want to end by um, thanking the, the terrific group of people in my lab. So this year was my, uh, or I guess last year now, was my 20th anniversary of running my, my academic lab. And my lab knew I had come from Hawaii. And they said, let's go to Hawaii to have a meeting to celebrate. So I took them to Hawaii. Uh, so we, we went to my hometown. Uh, in Hawaii, and, um, and uh, uh, I think I mentioned most of the, the folks along the way that, that did the work that I described. I also want to call out uh, Kai Hong Zhao, who's been with me for 20 years, 21 years now, almost in my lab, who's sort of my right-hand woman in the lab and a spectacular scientist and really responsible for a lot of the, the things that we've been able to do over the years. And then I mentioned uh, these folks uh, as well today, my uh, various collaborators that we've had a lot of fun uh, working with on these projects. And I also want to thank our funding sources. So um, this project was actually started uh, because I got a little grant from the NSF to explore CRISPR systems in bacteria, which was really very enabling for us. And uh, we also got a little bit of money from the Gates Foundation and more recently from the NIH through the Center for RNA Systems Biology, which now funds a couple of people that are working on uh, CRISPR biology in the laboratory, especially in terms of applying it to um, various uh, human systems. And then, of course, I'm grateful to HHMI uh, as well. And uh, with that, I'll stop and thank you for your attention. I'll try to answer questions if you have them. Thanks a lot. Fantastic talk, as always. I was wondering, um, obviously, CRISPR loci don't expand indefinitely, and um, they are maintained at a certain length. Um, how is that done? Is there simply a, a, a limit in terms of the length, how long they grow, and older ones that are not used again are lost in some way? Is that known? 
So yeah, so these, these CRISPR systems, uh, you're right, they, they obviously don't expand indefinitely. Um, and they're very different lengths in, in, uh, in you know, natural bacteria. Some are very short, they include one or two spacers, and some are many dozens of, of, of spacers long. It's not really clear what controls that. It, but it is known that the spacers that are incorporated most recently are also tend to be the most active, right? And so the ones that are oldest on the other end of the locus tend to be less active, and that probably also makes sense because phage are, by that point, probably you know, mutating or, or have been able to have time to mutate to avoid uh, targeting by those spacers. But it's a great question. I mean, you know, how are these sequences maintained even though they have, direct, you know, they have these repeated elements? They're not recombined away, and so something must be in place to, to maintain them, and we don't yet know what that is. Can you tell us a little bit more about the protospacer? Is there any recognition? of self versus non-self, or uh, is yeah. any piece of DNA? Right, so, so, right. so I, I, didn't, I didn't mention this, but the, in, in bacteria, you could ask why, why is the PAM motif so important for target recognition? And actually, that, that's really what is responsible for self versus non-self. And this was actually work originally done by Eric Sontheimer and, and, and Luciano Marafini. So, you know, it, um, it, what, what happens in, in, in bacteria is that when, when these new spacers are integrated into the CRISPR locus, they go in with flanking repeat sequences that don't have PAMs, right? So they're actually not targeted by the system because, you know, at least as what I showed you here, what we think happens is that you really have to have that PAM interaction to, to initiate the, you know, the base pairing with the guide RNA. So that's really how self versus non-self is detected. But in terms of acquiring new spacers, that's sort of another question of, you know, how do you how do you know where, which, which DNAs do you want to acquire new spacers from? Really not clear yet. And in fact, some uh, evidence suggests that, that these systems acquire, can acquire from wherever they find DNA, including they can get bits of the chromosome if they find it available to stuff it into the CRISPR locus. That could, in theory, be lethal to the cell. Yes, the so case. that's right. So if you do it under conditions where, you know, if you do it with an active, a fully active CRISPR system, of course, you never see them because those cells get killed off. But if you do it in such a way that you can adjust observe integration and, the, and you don't actually have functional targeting complexes being made, then you can actually see them. Thanks. So hey, I'm wondering Rachel. if in, in your cartoon, the, the two strands of DNA look like one is being, or yeah, DNA. One of them is being cleaved in the context of an RNA-DNA hybrid, and the other one is free. Is that true? Are those two active sites quite different to, to accommodate different things? And how does that compare to Cascade, for example, with this sort of full unwinding and those little bases that pop out? Right. So, so, um, so basically, so first of all, there's no structure yet of Cas9 that has a full DNA duplex. I think that will be very interesting to see. Okay. So we don't yet know what that actually looks like. Um, but there's a lot of indirect evidence and some recent single molecule data that's been published and other papers that I'm aware of that are not out yet that, that show that, that there really is nice evidence for a, what, what people call an R loop where you really have unwinding of the DNA. And, um, and so you have the, you know, you have, like you said, you have in one case you have a DNA-RNA hybrid where the DNA is getting cut and in the other case you have a single-stranded DNA that's getting cut. And the two active sites are very different. In one case you have a catalytic histidine that's involved. In the other case, it's a, a two or maybe it's a three metal ion mechanism that cuts uh, the DNA. So they're really, the chemistries are really different. And we've recently found that, um, that the, uh, the, the, the non-target strand, the, the, the single strand of DNA gets cut first and fastest, and then and only then does the other strand get cut. So there's some coupling between the two active sites as well. But, yeah. Another question? Yeah, so you mentioned um, that there's this constant sort of warfare going on between the, the phages and the bacteria. It sounds like that's at the level of the sequence of the phage, but it's such an ancient system, I can't believe that the phage aren't combating this in some way. So what are they doing that is inhibiting CRISPR or inhibiting those nucleases or, I mean, how do they hide their DNA? Are there strategies? Yeah, there are actually. So very, very much like you see in RNAi where there are these anti anti-microRNA uh, anti, uh, or anti-siRNA proteins that bind. So the same thing happens with phage. So there are these anti-CRISPR proteins that function. Um, so there have been a couple papers published on these. But I would say probably the most common way that they avoid being targeted by the CRISPR system is by mutation. And it's actually often mutation of the PAM in the target sequence, right? So they, they, they don't have to actually mutate the target site. They can just mutate the PAM, and then they actually become invisible to the system. So that's very uh, common. So you see phage, you know, 
people like Jill Banfield who do this kind of sequencing and have beautiful data sets of phage and then the bacteria that they infect and you can watch over generations these phage uh, evolving as the CRISPR systems evolve and there's very much a back and forth uh, at the level of the DNA um, for mutating to avoid and then the CRISPR system evolving to have new spacers that target other sites in phage. Okay, so we can go to the reception now and then see the posters and I'd like to thank Jennifer again. Thank you.